Speaker, Honourable uh, Prime Minister, Honourable uh, Cabinet Ministers, Honourable Leader of the Opposition, and fellow Honourable Members of Parliament. Firstly, I would like to join my colleague, the Honourable Leader of Opposition, and those from this side of the House in taking this time to welcome the Honourable uh, Prime Minister back into this August House. It is good to see that you are in good health. Eh? And I also take this time to remember those members of Parliament who remain unwell during this time, and let us keep them in our prayers and wish them a speedy recovery. Mr. Speaker, sir, I join my colleagues from the opposition side of the House in making a snap contribution and oppose the Bill No. 6 of 2022, which is for an act to appropriate a sum of $3 billion, $3 billion, $302 $956,187 for the only services of government for the year ending 31 July 2022. Mr. Speaker, first let me just say that this uh, supplementary budget looks like a fully fresh budget instead of a revised budget. After listening to the Honorable Minister for Economy for more than two and a half hours last night, I would like to be excited about it. But then, I realize that this is an election year, Mr. Speaker, sir. So we should never be surprised when things seem too good to be true. Earlier in this August House, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, when responding to an appropriation uh, bill, I had stated that the devil is always in the detail. Mr. Speaker, sir, I had stated that the devil is always in the detail. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, we all understand that a budget is a plan that is to be implemented. But whether they really are implemented will be the question. And I begin to, by looking at the zero-rated vet products, Mr. Speaker, sir, during this period of pandemic recovery, any savings will be appreciated. However, Mr. Speaker, sir, 99% of the time, businesses do not, do not pass their benefits to consumers. They find ways to retain existing costs. And I note, for example, zero rating of flour, sugar, rice, to name a few. And this comes day after the prices were increased. So the question is, how will government monitor the effective implementation of these policies, given that in recent, that in recently, entities have increased the prices of their product. The Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission, FCCC, is going to have an important task to ensure that the zero-rated initiatives are truly passed on to consumers. What now seems to be the current norm is that price policy initiatives are announced, announcements are made in this house, but prices on uh, foodstuff on the shops and supermarket shelves still remains, Mr. Speaker, sir. So nothing has been passed on to consumers. Mr. Speaker, I must say that a lot of things that the opposition side of the House had raised is in this revised budget. And for that, I must uh, thank and commend the Honorable Minister for Economy for listening. And listening is a, a biblical act. It's also a skill, Mr. Speaker, sir. And the Bible says that when you listen to advice, you gain wisdom in the future. It will enable you to grow, enable you to gain knowledge, to know the problems, and resolve them. Mr. Speaker, sir, since 2016, Mr. Del Papati and I had been advocating in this House for an increase in minimum wage to $4 per hour. That is well established in our Hansard report. And the gradual implementation this year is welcome on behalf of our people. To support such an increase, businesses must and should be assisted with the necessary policies and environment conducive for economic and employment generation and participation. And so, I will continue to be the devil's advocate. Whilst we appreciate the generosity of the increase, Mr. Speaker, sir, 
There remains areas which government needs to focus on to be able to assist businesses and employers meet this increased working capital. For instance, improve the ease of doing business and provide a better import reliefs for raw materials and equipments. Mr. Speaker, I noted that the Honorable uh, Minister has given assurances that the long-awaited electronic shuttle will begin its inception in Fiji around the Valley Levu areas. <coughs> Way back in 2015, Mr. Speaker, sir, I had raised in this August House that a U.S. company had expressed interest to government to assist with the monorail system for Fiji as a means of uh, reducing our travel hours and giving us better travel experiences. So seeing the implementation of such recommendation confirms to me that the Honorable Minister for Economy is recognizing the value and the experience in contribution coming from this side of the House. Yes. Yes. Mr. Speaker, sir, we will now look forward to seeing this project get off the ground. And hopefully, hopefully, it does not become another Waila City project or hundred cents casino projects, whereby they look and sound beautiful on paper, but are absent in reality. One of the things I've always said, Mr. Speaker, sir, is in leadership you need political will. And I note that government is recognizing the important role of civil servants and is reinstating a lot of entitlements like rural allowances and overtime due to respective cadres of employment. I said entitlements because that is what it is. These are payments long overdue to them. And in making the payments, government is acknowledging that it had failed in its duty in the past to be a good and responsible employer when it had removed or suspended these entitlements in the recent past. Again, Mr. Speaker, sir, I reiterate that the open merit recruitment system is not working or serving its stated objectives. Yes. Yes. Nurses, for example, have resigned in massive numbers, as acknowledged by the Honorable Minister in his speech yesterday, where he is saying that the recruitment of new students, student nurses will now be 350 for 2022 from the current 100 students intake per annum. Mr. Speaker, sir, it takes three long years for a student nurse to graduate, which means there will remain a gap in the health system provisions, particularly from that provided by the nurses. Mr. Speaker, sir, since 2014, I've stood in this house asking government to consider the plight of nurses and their entitlements. Again, these are well documented in the hindsight reports. It is always advisable to listen and act when the time is right. This is a few years too late, but now that, has been, that it has been implemented, we must ensure continued implementation and consistencies. It must not only be for an election year. Mr. Speaker, I see the Honourable Minister has removed paternal and family care leave. I wouldn't fuss about that if government provided stability of employment, especially in the civil service. I am receiving complaints from the civil service, say those in the Ministry of Education, Honourable Minister for Education, that a lot of them are sitting on six months contracts. I can name the department if the Honourable Minister for Education will want to refute. I raise this because I wonder if this practice is known and accepted by government. No employer must subject its workers to this kind of inhumane employment conditions. Yes. Mr. Speaker, in the past I'd asked government to be consistent by giving a minimum of three year term contracts to civil servants to allow them quality of life. And I note that in recent days, the Honourable Prime Minister had highlighted the pass rates of rural schools that seems to have fared better than the urban schools. And I must congratulate, congratulate all hard-working teachers and head of schools in this country. Whilst uh, some initiatives, incentives had been reinstated for them, 
many more continue to suffer from depressing working conditions. Some heads of school in the secondary school sector may be losing their jobs by 1st April 2022, should they not be called for a job test, which is a requirement set by the Ministry of Education. I address this question in this August House, Mr. Speaker, sir, as to why only some people have been called for job tests, while others with equally impressive qualification and experience have been overlooked. Again, Mr. Speaker, I have names of schools where these questionable practices have been inflicted. I am reliably informed that even the teachers' union have raised this issue with the Honourable Minister for Education. Mr. Speaker, sir, government will be an equal opportunity employer. And again, I question whether these inequitable practices are known to government. Mr. Speaker, sir, the legacy of leaders must always be your ability to walk the talk and ensure equitable distribution of wealth from all sectors in Fiji, and not just favoring a particular province, for example. Anything less, anything less screams discrimination, screams nepotism and chronism, which ultimately robs the nation of an inspired workforce, an ingenious pool of entrepreneurs, and you suppress creativity and productivity. Mr. Speaker, sir, generally speaking, there remains a depressed environment in the area of housing in Fiji, as we all know. Whilst we appreciate the assistance being provided for first home owners, we need to conduct a special audit on the budget provided for this scheme. Since its inception and its effective implementation, given the amount of requirement that is usually demanded from applicants. On that note, Mr. Speaker, I have been raising to government to consider imposing a price cap for real estate sales around Fiji to allow for the level of income in Fiji to commensurate with the affordability of housing prices. I had warned on the deplorable living conditions, especially university students receiving housing allowances, some who have had to rent in squatter settlements because of affordability. This goes back to the fact that housing prices are just too high. They are just too high, Mr. Speaker, sir. This goes with the Honorable Minister of Economy may suggest that this is a market that this is market driven. But Mr. Speaker, history is there for a reason for us to learn from. Developed nations uh, like Australia, New Zealand, Singapore are now a, a market for the wealthy and the elite, where the entry of real estate companies have skyrocketed prices in the housing industry, making buying a home a very rare dream to achieve. Fiji is only a developing nation, and yet we've seen international real estate companies entering our domestic markets. The Honorable Minister in his address last night said that the real estate market will now be regulated, limiting commissions charged by real estate agents on residential properties to no more than 2% of the sale value. While this is a very small difference, this will mean a very small difference to the continued escalation of housing prices. I reiterate that governments have to have a political guts to impose a cap on the real estate houses. For example, standard sets of homes in a certain areas, say in Amandi, should not uh, sell for more than a specific ceiling. We have to be human and logical about this, Mr. Speaker. Sir. Mr. Speaker, there is a lot of areas of improvement needed for this budget, especially in the areas of monitoring and implementation. I'm happy to see the extension of provision of electricity will be provided, hopefully, to areas like Waisa, Naterumai, Waisere, Nawaisomo, and other areas around Fiji, where work has already started and villages are waiting eagerly to switch on the power and receive electricity. Mr. Speaker, whilst uh, we talk about uh, infrastructure, some landowners in Etasiri have raised to me that the current lease arrangement for the electricity towers that runs from Monasabu to Cunningham is being paid a measly rate of $200 plus every four to six months. 
The landowners are well aware of the revenue generated from the provision of electricity to homes and the greater CBD areas along the Mansion Corridor, and they are crying for an equitable return for the use of their resources over the last 44 years and into the future. Especially, Mr. Speaker, sir, when restrictions have been placed on them on the use of, the, of this land. May I also throw in the plight of the landowners of Wailoa Power Station, who are also crying for the proper leasing and compensation of those buildings and infrastructures on their land. I remind this House that the landowners of Wailoa Power Station are a separate land owning unit from the Monasabu Dam landowners. The manner in which compensation has been paid in acknowledgement for the provision of electricity from Monasabu Dam has totally ignored has totally ignored the contribution from the land-owning units of Wailoa Power Station, where they have hosted not only the hydro power station, but also quarters of Energy Fiji Limited staff. Mr. Speaker, this is a long-standing act of discrimination and deprivation to the land-owning units of Wailoa, and I ask the Honorable Prime Minister to please intercede on this issue since earlier communication to the line minister and to EFL has not yielded any res results or responses, at least. Mr. Speaker, I learn by saying that government officials, including ministers, are servants of the people, and they must respond to those raising issues to them, especially from fellow members of parliament. And to conclude, Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge the new and continued initiative highlighted in this uh, supplementary budget given that it's only four months until the end of the government fiscal year to 31st July 2022. And I hope, I hope, Mr. Speaker, sir, that this would be a good year for everyone, especially our voters. Now, William. I thank the Honorable Mr. Rodolfo for his contribution to the debate.